Greetings, Earthlings. I'm back with another audio interface review for you guys. God, I'm so excited about this. Today, we're talking about this guy, the Universal Audio Arrow. If you do want to pick this guy up, it'll set you back around 500 bucks. Like always, I'll throw some links down below. And for this review, I have the Rode NT1 connected directly to the Arrow with my gain set at around 10 o'clock. Not going to do any post-processing, compression, or EQ, but I will likely boost it in post. So check the doobly-doo to see what I did. Now let's talk about what comes in the box. Ah, uh, opened up. First off, you're obviously going to get the interface. You get a quick start guide, and that's actually all you get in the box. This thing does not even come with a Thunderbolt 3 cable. But on that note, if you do plan on buying this interface, make sure the cable you're getting is a Thunderbolt 3 cable, and make sure that USB-C port on your computer is Thunderbolt 3 as well, because this is not backwards compatible. Now as far as specs, this thing has a bit depth of 24 bit, a sampling rate of 44.1 up to 192 kilohertz, plus 48 volts of phantom power, a gain range of plus 10 to plus 65 dB, and a negative 20 decibel pad. And lastly, this thing actually has a processor in it, and I think it's a single core processor, but what that allows you to do is run Universal Audio's plugins at near zero latency, and when you buy certain Universal Audio gear, sometimes they'll throw in, I think, 60 plugins for free. Now, as far as the build quality, this thing feels pretty dang amazing. It does have an all aluminum chassis, as well as a foam bottom to keep it from sliding around on your desk. The XLR ports don't wiggle around too much. The buttons all have a nice tactile feedback so you know when you press them. The dial is not loose at all and it also has a nice tactile feedback when you press it. And the quarter inch inputs on the front for the headphone and hi -Z input are nicely attached as well. On the front of the interface, you're going to find a quarter inch instrument input so you can plug in a guitar, bass, or keyboard directly into the interface. And then you'll find a quarter inch headphone output, which does offer latency free monitoring. On the back of the interface, you're going to find the Thunderbolt 3 plug to connect this to your computer. You'll find a set of quarter inch outputs to run this to your powered monitors. And you'll find a set of XLR combo jacks for XLR or quarter inch mic or line level inputs. Okay, so the first thing you're going to find on the front of this interface is this metering section, which will show you the levels for your channel 1 or channel 2 input, as well as your output to your headphones or the quarter inch outputs on the rear. And it will also show you the status of these buttons down here, which we'll cover right now. First, you have the input button, which will adjust the type of input you are using on the channel that you have selected. So currently, I am on channel 1, and I am using the mic input. If I were to push this, it would change it to line input, or if I had an instrument plugged into the front of this interface, I could switch it to high Z. Then you have the high pass filter button, which will initialize a high pass filter. No big surprise there. Then you have the plus 48 volts phantom power button, which will turn on or off phantom power for that channel. Then you have a pad button, which will obviously decrease the input level in case you're recording really loud sound sources. And as you can tell, it decreases it quite significantly and you can hardly hear me. Then you got a phase invert button in case you are recording multiple microphones on the same source and you are getting any kind of phase cancellation. And lastly, you got this link button, which will link up channels 1 and 2 into a single stereo set. Then you got two more buttons over here. You have preamp and you have monitor. These are going to do a couple of different things. The first thing they will do is by pressing them, it will select what you're adjusting with this dial up here. And additionally, by pressing the same button a second time, it will change the source that you are adjusting. So if I press the monitor button a second time, it will go to the quarter inch outputs on the rear. If I press it one more time, now I am adjusting my headphone volume. Now currently I am on the monitor section and in order to get back to adjusting the mic pre's I will just go ahead and press the preamp button and then I am adjusting channel 1. If I wanted to switch to channel 2 I could press it one more time and now we're adjusting channel 2. So now let's go ahead and talk about this dial. So it is not just a dial but it is also a button and as you can tell over here that while I am in the preamp mode I can go ahead and click this button to switch between channel 1 and channel 2 to really quickly adjust the preamps level. When I am on the monitor section, if I have the headphone selected, pressing the button does nothing. But if I am on the monitor output adjustment, if I press this, it will mute the output in case you need to very quickly mute your output sources. 
And I actually think that's it for the front of this interface. So now we're looking at the UAD console software. We're not gonna go too into depth because it is just too complex. If you do wanna go further in depth, go check out UAD's tutorials. This is just gonna be a very brief overview. Right now we're on the overview tab and you can see we have a basic channel strip for inputs one and two. You got the ability to adjust the preamp gain. You can add a unison preamp, which is burnt into your recording and actually adjusts the physical properties of that XLR input. You have the ability to add some effects. You can do some aux sends to create some kind of bus mix. You have the ability to pan left and right. You can solo, you can mute, and then you have a final fader. Then if you jump to the inputs tab, this is just a much more simplified version of the channel strips for input one and two. If you jump to the inserts tab, this is just going to give you a more granular view of the inserts that you've added to that channel. And then if you jump to the sends tab, this will just go ahead and give you a more detailed look at your aux sends. Then on the right hand side of the software, you have this meter that will be permanently set there. Then you have insert effects. UAD rec means that any inserts or effects that you have added to your channel will be recorded to your DAW. UAD mon means that those effects will only be heard in your headphones. As I previously mentioned though, if you have any unison preamps enabled, those will always be recorded to your DAW. You cannot bypass those. Then down here, if you just click show aux, this will show you your bus mixes. You can show your control room, which will allow you to adjust the dim level or show your control room mix. You're also able to adjust the quarter inch outputs to be mono to check for phase cancellation. You can mute it here and you can also adjust the level right here as well. Then down here at the bottom of the window, you can set your tempo in case you have any delays. You're also able to set your recording resolution or clock speed. You're able to set your clock to internal or external. And then you just have this little meter down here telling you how much of your DSP resources you're currently taking up. Now I'm not gonna go in depth here, but there are some additional console settings for your hardware, your IO matrix, the display on the actual interface, your plugins and all of the UAD plugins, as well as the MIDI. Now let's go ahead and test the noise floor of this interface's preamps using the method that I'll link right up here. Now I have the Shure SM7B connected directly to the arrow with my gain set at around two o'clock. And the reason I do this test is the SM7B is a notoriously quiet microphone. And I think it's a good indication of the quality of a preamp to find out if it's capable of driving this microphone, but more importantly, if it's capable of driving this microphone cleanly. So as you can see on the screen, I don't have any unison preamps enabled on this channel. This is just the raw preamp of the Universal Audio Arrow. But now I'm gonna go ahead and initialize the U-Audio 610B preamp or the unison preamp and show you how it sounds. And this is how the microphone sounds running through the U-Audio 610B emulation. As you can tell, it does have a little bit of a saturated tube tone, which is what you would expect out of a tube preamp emulator. And in my opinion, I think it sounds pretty nice if that's the tone you're going for. So I switched off the Unison Pre's, but now I'm gonna go ahead and initialize the Teletronics LA-2A, which I am just a huge fan of, and I use this thing probably more than I should. And now I've initialized the LA-2A, and as you can tell on this screen, we're only getting maybe three decibels of compression. Now, by no stretch of the imagination am I a compressor master. I don't know much about analog compressors. I can just go off of what this sounds like, and to my ears, I think this thing sounds really nice and very musical, and I use it on my podcast regularly. So right now I have Logic Pro open. I have the internal clock set at 192 kilohertz, 
And as you can see, with an I.O. buffer size of 256 samples, we have a round trip latency of 5 milliseconds or 1.6 milliseconds output. If we drop it to 128, we're down to 3.5 milliseconds or 1 millisecond. And if we drop it to 64 samples, we're down to 3 milliseconds round trip or half a millisecond output. Okay, so right now I have my Les Paul Studio, which has passive pickups plugged directly into the Arrow's high Z input. I don't have any amp simulators turned on. I'm going to play and show you how it sounds as just a strictly DI, and then I'll turn on the provided Plexi Classic amp sim and show you how that sounds. <laughs> Okay, so normally when I'm reviewing something, I can't wait until I can jump back to my regular setup, but this interface is one of the rare cases where I don't want to stop using it. I want to keep using this thing. It's so much fun. In terms of pros, it does have that processor in it, meaning you are getting near zero latency live DSP processing. Additionally, it is bus powered, meaning you don't have to have an external power brick. You're also getting 65 decibels of gain, and on that note, when you have it at 100%, the noise floor is not that bad. It has some really nice high-res analog to digital converters, it has a good headphone amp, it has really great latency, especially if you're using the live DSP. It has a really nice build quality that I may consider trusting throwing in my travel bag, and it offers plus 48 volts of phantom power strictly off that Thunderbolt 3 cable. And then in terms of cons, relative to other interfaces out there, this is pretty expensive, but considering what you're getting, I think you're still getting a really good deal. It does have a fairly steep learning curve if you want to do a deep dive or do any kind of complicated routing in the console software. It is locked into Thunderbolt 3, which really limits the number of computers that are able to use this currently. And lastly, some software just did not seem to like this thing very much. I had zero issues with my DAW, like Logic Pro or Final Cut Pro for for that matter, but when I was trying to run this into Discord for a voice chat, it just did not want to work. So in order to fix that, I had to run this interface through Rogue Amoeba's loopback and then run loopback into Discord. So I just wanted to point that out. Some software just seems to be a little bit finicky when it comes to Universal Audio's routing software. So would I recommend this thing? If you couldn't tell, of course I would. Testing this thing over the last two or two and a half months has been an absolute joy, and I hate to admit it, but the live DSP processing and the Universal Audio plugins have kind of become essential for my podcasting workflow, so I don't think I can actually stop using this thing. I think it needs to stay on my desk. But I just think that this is a perfect interface if you're looking to dive into the Universal Audio ecosystem and play around with some of their plugins and find out what you like. For instance, if you're a musician and you can't afford all that really expensive, sexy analog outboard gear, this thing comes with some pretty rad plugins that will get you close to that and add some really nice color to your recordings and make it sound less sterile like you're not recording everything in the box. And the same thing goes for podcasters. You can still get a really clean tone out of this thing, but you also get to play around with some really nice emulations of outboard gear that podcasters typically don't get to use, and that's what I've really enjoyed about this thing. So when it comes down to it, if you got 500 bucks to spend and you're looking for a dual channel XLR interface with live DSP processing, I just don't think you can go wrong with this thing. This thing is incredible and I absolutely love it. All right, guys, that was a lot longer than usual, I know, but there's a lot to cover here. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. If you hated it, thumbs down. Want to influence what I review next? Geeksrising.com slash podcast and go cast a vote there. Want more videos like this? Click the logo beneath me. Check out the Discord server. Link in the description, and I will see you all later. Thanks for watching. Bye.